Thank you, David. Trust you all. Um, my name is Phil Collerton. I'm uh, moderating this session. Um, I'm the Managing Director of the Uptime Institute uh, for the EMEA region. Um, I have a series of questions here, obviously, which we've prepared, but I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So if there's something you want to ask, or if you think we're getting off the point, put your hand up and there's a microphone, and make this as interactive as possible. Okay? I'd like to get my panel of uh, four people here to introduce themselves and to give a little bit of background about uh, their interest or level or thoughts on uh, artificial intelligence, specifically within the data center environment are. And then we'll run to uh, some questions. So if I can start with uh, Jonas first, please. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Jonas Kena, and I work for a company called Etix. <coughs> Etix Everywhere. And just by name, we're trying to be everywhere. So we build, we finance, we design, we build, we operate data centers globally. We're trying to get to 300 data centers uh, by probably 2025. There's a lot of data centers globally. <coughs> and the question we're asking ourselves is how can we manage all these data centers? So we have about 120 employees, and half of those employees are researching and developing AI within data centers. Because we want to be in a position where these 300 data centers globally can manage themselves. And we just work together just to make sure that everything goes well. So I look after UK and Ireland. And AI is of interest to Andrew, please. Yes, my name is Andrew Burgess. Um, I'm an independent consultant. Um, I, I work for um, a number of different companies as a strategic advisor, um, uh, including companies like Symphony Ventures, which is an implementer of robotic process automation, and uh, Celaton, which is a, an AI software vendor. And um, I'm, I'm quite a generalist, so I'm not specifically looking at, at data centers with AI, I look across all businesses, so typically I go into any business and look for opportunities to, uh, to exploit robotic process automation and artificial intelligence um, across the board. Um, but clearly within the IT world, um, both of those technologies are, are making some, some really big waves in terms of uh, the benefits that they can bring to that, so, so I've got a, a strong interest in that as well. Good. Yes, <clears throat> my name is Kirk Muller. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Great Mountain Data Centers uh, out of uh, Norway. We operate two data centers, one in, uh, 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 inside a mountain, uh, in a former NATO ammunition store inside a mountain. It's quite a unique data center. Uh, and uh, uh, we have employed, being in Scandinavia, where labor cost is quite high, we have put a lot of effort into automating everything we do and uh, putting intelligence behind it. So that's uh, the main background that I have an interest in. Monica? I'm Monica Kass. I'm in the data center industry. I'm from Germany and therefore my English is not perfect. Uh, yes, one of I make business development and consulting and one of my special theme is data center infrastructure management helping companies to use this for automatism and such on. And at this time, I have a very big project for a company who is looking for, a, not a solution, it's a, a special, uh, it's a solution for this company, not a product, uh, all over the world. Okay. So I'd like to um, start, Andrew, I'll open it up with you. Um, very much a basic question. <clears throat> How do you define AI in the business context? How would you define it, sorry? <clears throat> so, I, I gave a talk earlier on today where I answered exactly that question, so, so it's a good one to start. Um, there's lots of different definitions for AI. Um, a lot of them are around um, taking the, the cognitive tasks that, that human beings do and replacing those with computers. That's probably the easiest thing. It's, it's, it's using computers to do human intelligent tasks. Um, there's a little bit of a circular argument here because we're talking about intelligence and artificial intelligence. Um, the, there's other definitions. Um, somebody said it's like anything that happens 20 years in the future, because it's always, you know, now, now we have AI and, and we use it, you know, it's AIs on our phones, then we don't treat it like AI. So everyone says, well, it's AI must be something that's happening in the future. Um, there was a very good definition by um, Andrew Ong, who's the 
um, Chief Technology Officer with Beidou, which is the, uh, the Chinese social media uh, firm. Uh, he's, he's kind of a, a bit of a rock star in the AI world, and he, he kind of classified AI tasks as anything that, 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 is, that can take um, about a second of a human to, to, to analyze. So if you've got a thought or a task, and it takes you about a second to think about that, then it's probably a good candidate for, for, uh, for artificial intelligence. And to look specifically within the data center environment, how would you define AI? Well, uh, of course, it's uh, very much into the same uh, thoughts and hands here, but uh, uh, what we are looking at is uh, also this artificial intelligence or self learning of systems so that they learn how to optimize uh, automatically or the systems themselves learn how to optimize uh, our operations and systems. Jonas, I mean, you know, you sound ambitiously, you, know, you want 300 data centers in the next X number of years, short period of time, and given the constraints, they're going to have to all be automated. What does that mean for you? How do you see AI within the data center, specifically within the data center, running a data center specifically? Well, um, so certainly as a company, we look at AI from two perspectives. It's all part of the same process. So on one hand, we have to see the data center as an entity that has vision. So human vision side of things, where it has facial recognition, facial detection, um, using that as an entry system for, from a protection perspective or entrance perspective. Um, but also space awareness. So for the computer, the camera, will be a 360 degree camera, we'll be able to recognize any changes not through heat mapping, but just through the actual space itself. Any changes in the space. So if someone, an engineer, comes into the site and leaves his toolbox for whatever reason, it's the camera that will be able to recognize that there's something that's changed. And also recognize that actually that change was due to this engineer. And they'll be able to automatically contact the engineer for the engineer to go back, for example. Um, but also, as um, Minters alluded to, neural networks, and we believe that um, that may be an evolution of decent. So we have our own decent product, which is based on Golang, um, and the database is Influx database, which again is Go. Uh, the database management is Apache, Cassandra, and all of that is so that we can use new AI algorithms that come through, um, through Google, uh, because at the end of the day, if we can optimize energy, if we can optimize energy usage, if we can optimize cooling, then um, that's just beneficial for many reasons. Hey Monica, you mentioned uh, data center automation, uh, infrastructure automation. I mean, to what levels are people already doing this today? Um, and how far how far do they have to go, do you think? Okay. I told you before, I have had a dream. It was in the year 1984 okay. that I am such in the next years in the chair and waiting and looking that all the uh, robots and uh, systems will do it. Now we have the year 2017, 2017 and okay, not really far away and therefore I think we can do it. We have to do it, but we have to learn, we have to understand and we have to accept that the machines make the decision. Um, I have had, we'll have a discussion about, is a digital twin, is a solution for automatisms for robots as well, next week for data center as well. And I think that could be help. If we have a digital twin of all our systems, that we could learn about that, that we give the information about maybe our cracks or something back to the supplier and he learns from that and we got all the information back in the auto uh, industry we have it. And I think it could be a way for the data center infrastructure industry as well. I will have a discussion about that next week and I'm thinking about that. And I think yes, but not next year, then on it in the next five years. I think it's a step, step by step. I mean, look, I mean, we mentioned DSIM, which is like effectively data center automation at the moment, more or less, discuss. Um, where do you see DSIM going? Do you think, you know, DSIM, we talk about DSIM, it was big hype, it's been big hype for four or five years now, and now DSIM is going to be doing everything. We have a software operated data centers. I think we're still some way from seeing those in mass operation. 
Um, do you see that logically going forward, further forward, or do you think you know, there's going to be a block at some stage where the people are still going to be involved? No, well, I, I, I think there will be people involved, but uh, let me roll back a little bit because uh, we, uh, we have today uh, installed decent uh, systems. We have, uh, I think we measure like 30,000 points every uh, oh, many times a second uh, throughout the data center. And we had decided from day one that we shouldn't delete any data. We want to have the data there so that we can learn from it and use it in our uh, uh, development of our tools. And then we looked at the ways of finding uh, uh, if there were tools available. And in our re the research we've done, we, we didn't find any decent tools that were adapted to co-location that we do. Uh, most of them are based on uh, were based on enterprise or hyperscale, or uh, and so so we couldn't use that. So we have actually developed more or less our own platform uh, to. to Optimize our data and using the data, and then planning to implement uh, artificial intelligence to uh, to uh, analyze and to learn from this. But because we do see that it has tremendous effects, that we already know, see that just how we balance pumps it, uh, of different types and how we uh, fans and different types of equipment has a lot of impact on the power usage, which is of course extremely important. But I'm not really nice. Yeah, <clears throat> I was just going to say there's a very good example. I don't know, some of you may have heard of this before with um, with Google's data centers. So they they bought a, an AI company called DeepMind uh, a few years ago for um, vast amounts of money. Uh, and DeepMind thinks some very interesting stuff. Um, but what they what they did was they used the DeepMind DeepMind technology AI technology to analyze all the data of the Google data centers around cooling. And um, so they looked at, I think it was 120 different variables within the data center, you know, the, the, the fans and, and even whether, whether the windows were open or not, and all this sort of stuff. And, and they, they managed to reduce the energy uses from cooling by 40%. And, and that's, that's a massive amount of, of, of money. And I think the overall percentage of energy usage in, in the data center went down by 15%. So that, that's, deep, deep mind is very, Kind of cutting edge AI technology, but you know it didn't take them that long to to use DeepMind to apply to their data centers. And you know, there's, uh, those are in, the, in my talk earlier on. I've seen this great graph where you got the the, the energy usage go. Da, 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 they turn the machine learning on and go, da, and, then da, 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 and then they turn it on again, and off again, and it goes it goes back up again. It's, it's you know, a fascinating demonstration. You see, I mean, that's a really interesting um, example. And the fascinating point about the example, something fascinating to me, is that the perfect storm we have is, yes, we have the computational power to achieve this uh, with DeepMind, but also big data. It was really how DeepMind um, worked with Google's data center is they had to use five, work, five years worth of data. So it's almost like if we have been um, dealing with our current data centers and just getting that information, I think that you, you referred to this earlier, whereby there's no such thing as useless data. It's almost like we need unstructured data. The key now is not about structure, but moving to unstructured data, because that information can be analyzed and utilized somehow. And it's about Google being able to train the machine to actually train itself. And so one definition I have for me when it comes to AI is teaching code how to code itself. So once you've done one code and then it just goes off and it uses data to basically have a feedback loop to learn how to analyze and predict what's happening with the data center and then obviously have real-time analysis with the cooling system to be able to obviously reduce the PUE. That's fascinating for us and that's a game changer what we believe in the IT world, completely the IT world, not just data centers, but the IT world in general, which have profound effects or impact on the data center itself. So essentially self-learning AI is going to teach itself with the data That's one aspect of AI, but that's certainly the one that seems to would have the biggest impact on IT.
is um, deep neural networks. We're utilizing the cognitive, mimicking the cognitive behavior of humans with artificial neurons to be able to learn from itself and then start to make mistakes and then learn from its mistakes with more data coming through until we get a fairly accurate or very accurate prediction of a decision to be made. And then the question is, would you bring other decision making AI technologies to then make the decision once they've got the actual answer for the predicted technology? And Monica, do you see any risks in that, that sort of thing happening where you're effectively bringing in more AI to take decisions? based on stuff pulled together by AI? It depends. It depends on the people who are using it and uh, it needs, yes, from the management uh, and from all the people that they accept it, that it will be done. Um, from my feeling, uh, we have much more than the power uh, in the DCIM. We have also the IT, we have the telecommunication, we have the cabling. I think we, we need all the I, uh, infrastructure inside the data center because it's important in, in the future of time. We, we, it's not possible that our IT will uh, break down and therefore we have to know and to learn if some maybe it could be an accident, we have to transport this data and all the servers and virtual machines in other data center. And that would, should be automatically because I think we need it for all our business. That will be the future. And okay. therefore we have to prepare it. And we have to prepare all our processes and rules. That's the thing. Prevent, prevent, prevent. That is our future. So you know, just move, stepping back a little bit from operations, we've been really been talking about applications and running data centers. <coughs> what, what, what AI uh, influences do you see in data center design and by extension into the construction of data centers? How do you see that uh, developing? It's a, a tough question. Uh, uh, well, anybody I, else wants to jump in? Uh, I, I think uh, in general, artificial intelligence will be used in uh, going forward in almost all aspects of it. It's about the design, uh, how to operate, uh, how to uh, uh, yeah, how to manage all aspects. So, uh, but to predict how that will affect the design of the data center is, is impossible. Well, that's what we're here for. We're, just <laughs> to, we're here to make some predictions. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of um, design <coughs> design things that AI. I, could look at and a lot of it is um, almost trial and error so looking at you know the, the different um, simulations yeah si exactly simulations but just being able to do that so much more faster than, than anybody else you know, humans could do well, well, I also think that because um, um, you've got you, you mentioned earlier there's the effects of AI on business that affects the data center itself yeah. and then there's AI within the data center how does that affect the design and um, one key aspect is location I think historically data centers have been in urban areas because you have access to people, you have access to um, people that want to go into data centers and work. A lot of the staff doesn't have to be the physical infrastructure, it could be guys that are dealing servers, applications, or what have you. I think as AI takes over, uh, more and more of those human aspects. And what is the point of having a data center in a location when you think of humans? It's now more about cooling, so you have Norway, Cognitive, for example, um, and the uh, Nordics. Um, and uh, other other reasons, transportation of data as well, which sites, these would be other reasons why we put data center location rather than the business. Okay. Um, going back to the operations side, Andrew, um, you know, Uptime Institute research shows that most outages are caused by human error, and by human error, I don't just mean somebody pressing the wrong button, but the whole management culture that led to that person but, you know, pressing the wrong button. Um, you know, how far do you think automation, robotics, and AI can maybe tackle this issue completely and remove it? Well, yeah, so, so the robotics piece is quite interesting. So it's, it's robotic process automation is different than AI, so just to make that, that clear, and it's about uh, having rules-based processes. So um, you can define a process, you know, write it down, then you can get a piece of software to carry out that process instead of a human doing that. So, um, this happens a lot in business at the moment. There are um, any, any any system that, that uses you know has kind of a swivel chair processing mentality to it. You know, somebody doing that, then that, then that, and that. All of that now can be can be replicated by by software agents. So if you think about that in the IT environment, anything in terms of you know um, uh, 
server resets or um, you know patching servers, any, anything that, that has a you know an IT professional doing that task, you can effectively get a, a robot to do that. So the beauty of that is once you've trained the robot to do it, it's going to do it exactly the same every time. I mean, it means you've got to train it correctly because if you get it, if you train it wrong, it's going to do it wrong 100% of the time. But if you if you train it correctly. Then it'll just do it again and again and again, in exactly the same way. So you don't need to retrain it. Um, you, know, people, you don't have a churn of, of people. The robots are still there. So it's you know the, the, the compliance, as well as just the cost savings you're going to get from that. Compliance is probably one of the biggest benefits. And Jonas, can you see the whole human error disappearing from data center operations in the, in the next ten years? Well, that is that is a hope, I guess. Um, I think. There are many aspects of human error. When, you, when people think about human error, they think obviously we press the wrong button. Oh no, we the old, everything's gone now. But in reality, it's also about um, the speed in which human beings make decisions. So you have a good decent would have um, um, an alarming system and would have an escalation system. And then when it gets to the human to make a decision, it might take a while to make a decision. It may have taken a while to actually get to that point where it has to make a decision. Or it could be that the whole system was designed wrong. Um, and so um, that has problems. And there's indirect issues as well that affect the data center. If you have um, machines now that design code to manage the data center, not human beings, so there is an aspect now that can go wrong. And then it's the same machines that actually make decisions based on predefined rules or knowledge or what have you. Then, um, and there's, there's obviously a different escalation system all the way down. It's very difficult to see how anything can go wrong beyond active God, of course. Have you noticed that something you might see in Green Mountain data centers? <laughs> or are you still going to be relying on your people? Well, uh, I think uh, robotics has been around for many, many you years. You have personal history in this, well, yeah, Yes, I... Uh, <laughs> father. Uh, yes, my, my, my father actually invented the first uh, spray painting robot for the... Uh, for, uh, industrial purposes in back in 64. So, uh, and I've been working with the robots since, uh, since, then. <laughs> since then, yes. I'm not that old, but, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so I, but so robots also fail. And uh, robots will have, they, they operate in, a, in, a, in an environment. And I think uh, uh, there will be I don't think we will be able to eliminate errors, and including human errors. So uh, people will be involved, but we can reduce it dramatically. And that's what robotics did, in a, uh, or has done. It, it's removed, first of all, it's removed people from kind of maybe the, uh, the uh, jobs that were not attractive because they were in an environment where you didn't want to work, like a spray painting booth or welding. Uh, Etc., which was not very attractive uh, and, and made it more accurate. And uh, I think we will see probably some of the same stuff in uh, data centers because, we, for example, we have hot islands and cold islands. And hot islands, if the temperature goes up, it's almost impossible to work in those zones. Uh, so it's, uh, I think uh, we definitely will we'll see it and uh, we will be uh, active in trying to implement that where it's at our reasonable for companies like that. And Monica, can you see human error being replaced completely? No. No? Because the hobbits was also trained by people. <laughs> yes, well, it's the point Andrew was making earlier. If you yeah. train a robot to do the wrong thing, yeah. then it'll do it consistently wrong. But if you apply artificial intelligence, uh, then they may be trained themselves. Yeah. So. Well, that's, that's what I was sort of getting at before. Yeah. Do we, do, before, do we actually see that within the data center environment, it will kind of sound a little bit like Terminator now, but where the rise of the machines, where they, be, they actually develop their own intelligence and to, the, to the extent that they can teach themselves to do new tasks? Well, we have to, we have to make a clear distinction here, yeah. um, because we have, we have, we've been talking now about weak AI, um, and weak AI is when you give a machine software specific tasks to do. So Alexa, very, very specific task, NLP, you know, natural language processing, should answer you. But Alexa can't do a drug, she can't drive a driverless car, she can't run a data center. 
So that's very specific, that's weak. AI. And they will never take over anything because they are very clear with their specific task. You have strong AI, which we're some way to, we're very close to achieving that, um, or at least some way to achieve that, where it's generalized, where they're mimicking the human brain. That's fine. Um, the problem with how far we are to achieve and generate AI depends on not big data, all of these things, they're all there, but on computing power. Now I know that in the last 15 years, 20 years, Moore's law has been very nice, very you know, nice um, you know, curve. Um, every two years, computer power doubles, that's fine. But we're now getting towards the end of Moore's law, whereby there's only so much now that you can put on a silicon chip, it's as simple as that. And if you get too much on, too little space of a chip, then they become very volatile. Um, the, 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 how the workings of it, and it becomes too hot, and it just won't work. When that time comes, you'll be thinking about molecular chips, or you know, uh, there's all kinds of thoughts about you know, nuclear chips, all sorts of thoughts, and none of them are actually stable at the moment. So that might hold back, get to a point, even though all the other variables are in place, to say generalized AI. Yep. But if we do get to generalized AI, when they now start to think about poking in themselves, and being better and sharper and more intelligent human beings. That's when what's called an intelligent explosion happens, where their evolution will be a lot quicker than our slow evolution over the years. And then we'll be in trouble. But is that, is that science fiction? I still think so. What do you think, Andrew? Yeah, I agree. So the, the, there's this thing called singularity where, yeah. where um, machines become more intelligent than humans and it, it's said it explodes. Um, Ray Kurzweil says that's 30 years time. I think it's I think it's a lot longer. Um, and this, this idea of narrow eyes is is, is is a good analogy. It's just saying that today that's that's what the, that's what the AI does, and, and that's what it focuses on. As long as we're in that world, and I think we're a long way from it, from artificial general intelligence, then then we, we don't have anything to fear. And what's your, what are your thoughts on the point about Moore's law, which was a second point there? Are we coming to the end of Moore's law as well? Or? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm reading interesting stuff almost every day that using DNA to store yeah. um, to store stuff. Uh, IBM have, have been able to store information on a single atom, on a Holmian atom. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff happening. So, um, you know, I think over over time that that you know will we'll break Moore's law quite quite quickly. Um, and there's quantum computing as well. You know, in terms of the processing side of it, but well, I can't store store anything. There's lots of Really big change, fundamental changes. I think in computing is going to come along. They're just very early days. Yeah, they're not really um, scalable. No, exactly. it's not something you can produce, but it's all research. Okay, and uh, yeah. if this is the respect, I don't know how important Moore's law is because, uh, nonetheless, the uh, escalation or the growth of uh, uh, IT systems or data uh, systems. Is so huge and it's uh, still in the early stages. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's the more important part than actually whether it, you can do it in one cubic centimeter or, or millimeter or uh, whatever. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the point is that it's it's you're right. We still got a way of more still carrying on a consistent curve. But the point is relative to where um, AI will be that it would be at the point where it's general AI, but now thinking of things. So the point is, where we are now is that I think we're at the stage where AI now, general AI, can think like insects. That's where it is currently. Um, once it gets to a point where it starts thinking like 